Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you a true story from the life of J. Edgar Hoover on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here's our distinguished host, Mr. Edward Arnold. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, our true story is transcribed from the life of John Edgar Hoover, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In honoring Mr. Hoover, we also honor the FBI and the thousands of men whose meticulous, relentless labors have built one of the world's greatest law enforcement agencies. The case you are about to hear was selected by the FBI because it exemplifies the teamwork and cooperation between the local law enforcement agencies, the Bureau, and you, the private citizen, that is so necessary in the constant battle against crime. Tonight, the Hallmark Hall of Fame presents a radio document extracted from the official files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, United States Department of Justice. And now, here is Frank Goss. Did you have a nice Christmas? I surely hope you did. And I hope Hallmark cards contributed to your pleasure with both the cards you received and the ones you chose to carry your personal greetings to your friends. This week, too, you'll find that Hallmark cards can be of service to you. For in the fine stores featuring Hallmark cards, you'll find special thank you cards and Hallmark note papers so you can express your appreciation and gratitude for favors or gifts or cards received at Christmas. And you'll find a handsome array of New Year's cards to send your wishes for a bright and happy New Year ahead. So this evening, why not make a list of the people whose friendship you'd like to acknowledge and plan to send them each a Hallmark New Year's card. They'll appreciate your thoughtfulness and the fact that it's a Hallmark card will give them extra pleasure. For everyone knows the Hallmark and crown on the back of a card. The symbol you look for when you carry enough to send the very best. And now, Edward Arnold brings you the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Shortly after 8.30 a.m., January the 17th, 1934, a Lincoln sedan approaches the intersection of Goodrich and Lexington Avenues in St. Paul, Minnesota. The driver, Edward George Bremer, a member of a wealthy and prominent St. Paul family. As is his custom during the school term, he has driven his nine-year-old daughter, Hertzie, to a private school and is proceeding to his office at a local bank. As he stops for a traffic sign at Lexington Avenue, a stranger approaches the left front door of his vehicle. All right, Brennan, move over. Hey, what is this? You can't think not. Now, wait a minute. Get out of here. <coughs> Let's go. About 10.40 a.m., Walter McGee, a contractor, received a telephone call. In his office, 118 West Central Avenue, St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello? This Mr. McGee? That's right. You a friend of Ed Bremer's? Why, yes, yes. What? There's a note for you out the side door. If you want to see it again, you'll do like it says. Just like it says. Hello. Hello, who is this? Hello. Charles McGee. You are hereby declared in on a very desperate undertaking. Don't try to cross us. Your future and these are the important issue. Follow these instructions to the letter. Police have never helped in such a spot and won't this time either. Operator, get me Washington, D.C., please. National 87117. Your friend is none too comfortable now, so... Don't delay. Federal Bureau of Investigation.
National 87117, the emergency number of the FBI, available to any citizen 24 hours a day. A call to this number sets in motion a chain reaction, activating law enforcement agencies on a national basis. At 4 p.m. January the 17th, 1934, a meeting is held in the office of the director, located in the Justice Department, Washington, D.C. The facts have already begun to pile up. The ransom demanded is $200,000. Payment to be made in five and $10 bills. No new money, no consecutive numbers, large variety of issues. Excuse me, Mr. Hoover. Yes, Mr. Bryant. Wouldn't that seem to indicate that the kidnappers are professionals, part of an organized gang? In my opinion, yes. Is there a method of payment established, sir? The go-between is to insert an advertisement in the personal column of the Minneapolis Tribune. Payment instructions will follow. What about the second note, the one supposed to be from Bremer himself? Is that genuine? Any further word on that, Tolson? Well, both notes are addressed to Charles McGee. McGee's name is Walter. There are misspellings in both notes. However, there seems some possibility that Bremer's signature is in his own handwriting. Both notes and handwriting specimens are being flown to Washington. Good. Get them into the technical laboratory right away. When the handwriting experts finish, have chemical and microscopic tests run on the paper. I'd like a full report on quality, content, manufacture, and distribution outlets in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Yes, sir. Bryant, you and Kern will take the first available plane to St. Paul. I've ordered 20 special agents with experience in this type of case flowing into the area. They'll operate under your supervision. Very good, sir. Keep all activities undercover in order to facilitate the victim's release. Well, what about the ransom money, sir? The Bremer family has an indicated desire to make payment. You'll arrange with the Federal Reserve Bank in St. Paul to have a register made of the serial numbers of all bills. All right, sir. Only... Yes? The police report on the abandoned Lincoln sedan, the one Bremer was driving at the time of the crime, it mentions blood stains. That's right. Brownish stains on steering wheel, gear shift, door sill, back of front seat, and car floor. Identified as human blood. Well, sir, taken with the business about the note, wouldn't that lead to the assumption that Bremer is already dead? We can't make that assumption, Bryant. As long as there's a chance he's alive, our first job is to keep him that way. All right, gentlemen, that's it. You'll work out of the St. Paul field office, but I want personal reports on all developments. While the special agents of the FBI work undercover to ascertain the whereabouts of Edward Bremer and the identity of his abductors, Further ransom notes are received by Walter McGee and several other persons in the St. Paul area. One, addressed to Mrs. Edward Bremer and headed, Dear Pats, is unquestionably in the victim's own handwriting. For the moment, at least, Edward Bremer is still among the living. On January the 25th, following instructions given by the kidnappers, Walter McGee attempts to deliver the ransom payment. However, contact with the criminals is not established. For 10 days, silence. Then on February the 6th, a new demand for payment is received. Intermediary Walter McGee proceeds to Zambrota, Minnesota and deposits two suit boxes containing the sum of $200,000 at a spot marked by four red flashlights beside a dirt road. 24 hours later, at Rochester, Minnesota, Edward G. Bremer is released. Then you haven't any idea, Mr. Bremer, how long it took to reach the hideout. No, I'm afraid not, gentlemen. After I became conscious, I was still pretty woozy. And blindfolded, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I seem to think that we passed through a city. Not a big city, a medium-sized, maybe. You were blindfolded the whole time? No, no, not exactly. After a few days, I was allowed to be without the blindfold, but only in the one room. Then you never saw the house itself? The exterior, I mean? No. How about sounds, Mr. Bremer? You remember hearing anything distinctive? Well, not... Really distinctive. There were a couple of dogs. Barked a lot. Anything else? Well, let me see. Uh, children playing. Three or four of them. About what age? Oh, I don't know that. Somewhere between four and eight, I guess. Then there was a baby upstairs. It cried a lot and fussed. Year, year and a half old, I guess. That's about the ornery age. <laughs> it was my kids, anyway. I used to think a lot about Hertzie. Quite a lot. Especially when I heard that baby. I guess you understand. Sure. What about inanimate sounds? Uh, traffic, for instance. Yes, traffic. Heavy? Main highway? I think so. Uh, 
quite a few trucks and buses. I remember them shifting gears a lot. Like at a stop sign or a railroad crossing? Yes, that's that's what it sounded like. There were some trains, too, not too close. Uh, mostly morning and evening. Commuter special. Yeah, might be. Any noises peculiar to the house itself? Well, not that I can think of. Wait a minute. I'm pretty sure there was a coal stove in the next room. I could hear the coal being fed into it. Well, let's see now. That gives us a house with children and dogs having a coal stove near a main highway, not too far from a commuter. Mind describing the room, sir? Well, uh, small. I... Ten by twelve, I'd say, and run down. Old brass bed, fairly new wallpaper, and... Oh, the wallpaper. You remember the pattern? Clusters of forget-me-nots surrounded by pink roses. Think you could recognize it in a sample book? I'll never forget that wallpaper, Mr. Brown. One more thing, Mr. Brammer. The trip back from the hideout to Rochester. Remember any unusual details about that? Well, as I already told you, gentlemen, we started out in a business coupe, then switched to a four-door car of some kind, a sedan, I guess. And I had to squat on the floor behind the driver. Uh, there was a tin can next to me, about a regular old five-gallon gasoline can, I'd say. I could rest my elbow on it as we drove. Sure about its being a gasoline can? Yes, positive. I could smell the vapor. And then when we were part way, we turned off the main road, drove about ten minutes, and then stopped. I heard two of the men get out of the car, open up the trunk, and take out some tin cans. There were two or three of them, I think. And then they poured the gas into the tank. Now, you say this was off the main road. That's right. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of gravel striking against the fenders. Of course, it could have been some kind of a detour. Gentlemen, I'm afraid I haven't been much help. I... Do you mind telling me, in a case like this with so little to go on, is there any chance of their getting caught? Well, I... Say the odds are about 100 to 1. That they get away? No, sir. That they go to prison. Not much to work from. Traffic and a coal stove. A wallpaper pattern and a couple of dogs. Some gas cans and an old brass bed. From Washington, J. Edgar Hoover orders a careful rundown of every lead. Special agents from all parts of the country are flown to St. Paul to help do the job. February the 8th, FBI agents locate a wallpaper pattern similar to the one described by Edward Bremer in the St. Paul branch of a national mail order house. It is identified by the victim as identical to that on the wall of the kidnap room. A full check of sales records is commenced. February the 9th, special agents following the route taken by Walter McGee in paying the ransom discover four flashlights in a field several miles south of some border, Minnesota. They are traced to the F&W Grand Silver Store, 67 7th Street, St. Paul. A girl employee's description of the purchaser is forwarded to the FBI Identification Division in Washington to be checked against known criminal files. February the 10th, as a result of an FBI bulletin, the Sheriff of Columbia County, Wisconsin, turns over to the Bureau for large gasoline cans and a funnel found by a farmer near Portage, Wisconsin. They are flown immediately to Washington, D.C. to be checked by the single fingerprint section of the FBI's identification division for latent fingerprints. And a meeting is called by Mr. Hoover. All right, gentlemen, we've got some evidence. Let's see if we can put it together and come up with some answers. <clears throat> we know that there were at least five men involved in the kidnapping. We know we're dealing with a highly organized gang, most likely one of long standing. Next, there's a latent thumbprint on one of the gasoline cans. Did it match up to the file, sir? Yes, Arthur Barker, also known as Doc Barker. Next, the sales girl's description of the man who purchased the flashlights appears to be that of Alvin Carpus, and the girl has identified a photograph. Well, it all seems to add up. The Barker Carpus gang. Exactly. Just about the most dangerous and best organized group of criminals still at large. Well, we've made progress. We know our enemy, we know he's tough, now, let's find him. In just a moment, we'll bring you the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Probably we've all said at one time or another, wouldn't it be grand if we could keep the spirit of Christmas all through the year? 
Well, you know, some people never lose that wonderful spirit of warm friendliness and kindness. And right now, the fine stores where you buy Hallmark cards have a gift for you that's about the handiest way I know to help you keep Christmas thoughtfulness the whole year through. It's the Hallmark date book for 1955. And it's yours absolutely free as a gift from that store. This little book, small enough to fit in your purse or billfold, has a calendar page for every month of the year, with ample room on each date to write in your engagements and the names of friends you want to remember on that day. There's space for addresses, too, as well as room for your Christmas card list, which you'll probably want to bring up to date right now. The Hallmark Date Book actually serves you as your social secretary throughout the year, reminding you of birthdays, anniversaries, and all those occasions when you want your friends to know you care. And now your store has this Hallmark Date Book for you, a kindly remembrance that's yours for the asking. It's the fine stores that feature Hallmark Cards' way of wishing you health and happiness for the new year. And now Edward Arnold brings you the second act of our true story from the life of John Edgar Hoover. The first phase of the investigation of the kidnapping of Edward Bremer is over. J. Edgar Hoover and his aides have pinpointed their quarry. The Barker Carpers Gang, a big business in crime. Board of Directors, Kate Ma Barker, who made killing a family occupation. Her sons, Doc and Fred Barker, both known killers. Alvin Carpus, already one of America's most wanted men. Phase two takes time and patience and monotonous perseverance. Eleven months go by without a major arrest. Finally, in the first week of January 1935, the efforts of the director and of hundreds of special agents begins to pay off. Doc Barker is located in Chicago, Illinois, placed under surveillance 6.30 p.m., January the 8th. He's coming out. Let's go. Hold it, Barker. Federal officers, United States Department of Justice. You're under arrest. Among Doc Barker's effects, special agents find the following. Enough small arms to equip a squad of infantry. A letter in the handwriting of his brother, Fred mentioning an alligator hunt for a critter named Old Joe, a map of Florida with a pencil circle around the area of Ocala. J. Edgar Hoover moves quickly. Special agents were flown into the Marion County area of Florida. Investigation shows that Kate Parker and her son Fred are residing in a cottage located on Lake Weir. At dawn on the 16th of January, a picked raiding party approaches this cottage. The Barkers resisted arrest. When the government agents entered the house, both Ma Barker and her son were dead. We can close the files on the Barker family now, Mr. Hoover. Ma and Freddie were buried this morning. Doc's on his way to Alcatraz. That moves Carpus to the head of the list. Yes, sir. I've been working up the current date on him. I thought we might find a lead. All right, let's hear it. Well, for one thing, we know that he looks different. He and the Barker boys all tried to change their appearance and fingerprints by plastic surgery. If the Barkers are any example, it's probably a pretty badly botched job. Yes, sir. Anything else? There's one more item, fishing. He's become a nut on this subject. Our information is that he'd rather fish than eat. It's just about all he lives for now. Mm. It's funny. Man writes his name all over the middle of the continent with a machine gun, get what he wants, and finds out what he really wants. He could have gotten with a bamboo pole and a bent pin. Yeah, well, I sent out a bulletin to all field officers and local police to keep special surveillance on fishing resorts and tackle shops. Phase three, Alvin Carver's. The work is slow, methodical, monotonous. The results, nil. Then at Corpus Christi, Texas, a peer operator recognizes a photograph. You're sure this is the same man, Mrs. Humboldt? Dead sure. Oh, I'd know those eyes in a place. Cold. Like one of them big river catfish. Took out one of my boats most every day. Didn't get much, though. Always complaining about the fishing. Finally, about two weeks ago, he stopped coming. I guess he moved on. Any idea of where? Ever hear him mention trying some other spot? Yeah, come to think of it. He did say something about going to New Orleans. Oh, sleepy. Row, 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 row up 
Well, uh, yes, sir. I'm most sure to do recognize him. He's a fellow that bought the yellow feather jig day before yesterday. Happen to know his name? Great not. Lives somewhere in the neighborhood, though. Seen him around, drives a dark car, Plymouth, maybe. The reason I remember him so clear was that yellow jig. Can't catch no fish on a yellow feather in New Orleans this time of year. Word has flashed to Washington that Alan Tarpus, public enemy number one, has been located. The director, accompanied by associate director Tolson and a picked squad of special agents, flies to New Orleans to take personal command of the raiding party. <laughs> These plans are a detailed layout of the apartment corpuses occupying on Canal Street. As you can see, it's on a busy intersection, windows covering both corners, two exits, just about a perfect defensive position. Which way do we approach, sir? The raiding party will be divided into four groups. Group one, consisting of two cars, will park on Canal Street at 5 p.m. Tolson and I will approach the building from the north, meeting the occupants of the other car at the door. Group two will cover the back of the building. Bryant, you will take charge there. Yes, sir. Groups three and four will be deployed on rooftops and in an automobile cordon, respectively. Any further questions? Uh, <coughs> Canal Street's pretty heavily traveled that time of day, sir. Arrangements have been made with city street maintenance to hold one lane closed on the side of Canal Street nearest Carpus's apartment until just prior to 5 o'clock. That should enable us to rendezvous without interference from traffic and still not alert the fugitive. All right, gentlemen, we'll get the equipment together and be ready to go at 4 p.m. Block, sir. The other groups are in position already. Oh, no, cut right in front of us. There's too much traffic, sir. We can't get around him. Maybe he'll turn off to the next corner. No, he's still with us. I thought white horses were supposed to bring luck. Yes, it's Carpus. It's 50215 right now. We'll try forcing him onto the sidewalk. No. no. Not too much attention. You just have to stick it out. But there. Coming out of the apartment house. Yeah. yeah that's carpet's all right. Come on. All right, carpet. Oh, uh, Federal officers, you're under arrest. Well, it's Mr. J Man in person. What do you know? My duty to warn you. Yeah, 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 G-Man, I know. Anything I say will help me fry. If you'd have shown up just two minutes sooner, I could have welcomed you in style. That's right, sir. I just checked the apartment. It's practically an arsenal. I guess it's true after all, sir. About white horses, I mean. Huh? Come on, Coppice, let's go. With the arrest and eventual conviction of Alvin Coppice... J. Edgar Hoover and the special agents of the FBI wrote finis to the violent history of the Barker Coppers gang. The end result, 25 convictions, three persons killed resisting arrest, and three more killed by their own associates. Incidentally, we think you will be interested to know that Mr. Edward Bremer, the man who was kidnapped by the Coppers Barker gang, is living today and in fact is president of the Commercial State Bank in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm sure Mr. Edward Bremer is one man who can testify to the effectiveness and brilliant detective work of Mr. Hoover and his FBI. We asked the director if he had any comment to add to tonight's presentation. He asked us to say this, that there isn't one hero in the war against crime, but many. Thousands of law enforcement officers at every level of government and more thousands of courageous and alert private citizens without whose cooperation no law enforcement agency could function. In the words of Mr. Hoover, the war against crime is total war. Winning it is everybody's job.
Chris Arno will return in just a moment. When next we meet on the Hallmark Hall of Fame, it will be 1955. And on behalf of the makers of Hallmark Cards and all of us associated with the Hall of Fame program, I'd like to wish all of you a most happy and bright new year. In the year to come, as in the past, we will present plays about real people, plays planned for the enjoyment of the whole family. We hope you will find them both entertaining and stimulating. We want to thank you for joining us on Sundays. Our thanks, too, for remembering throughout the year to look for the Hallmark and Crown on the back of the cards you send. The symbol that you look for when you care enough to send the very best. Now, here is Edward Arnold. That sounds like an excellent idea to me, Frank. But this is the time of year we all like to do a little stock-taking to figure out where we are and where we're going. And this Hallmark date book sounds like a good way to take an inventory of how we're doing on the friendship side. You know, the older I get, the more I realize how much friends mean and how much little acts of thoughtfulness mean in keeping friendships growing. I'm sure the person who uses a Hallmark date book throughout this next year will be a happier person by the end of 1955. Well, next week we're starting out the new year with an exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It's the saga of Leif Erikson, the famous Viking, who first set foot on the shores of North America more than 1,000 years ago. It's a very exciting adventure, and I hope you will join us. And so, until next week, this is Edward Arnold saying good night. <laughs> sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The Hallmark Hall of Fame is produced and directed by William Crew. Tonight's transcribed strip by Robert Yale Lippert. Heard in tonight's cast were Barney Phillips, Harry Bartell, Wendell Holmes, Vic Perrin, Frank Gerstle, Lou Crookman, Whitfield Connor, Herb Butterfield, Virginia Gregg, and Roy Glenn Sr. Next week, the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television will present a dramatic story from the life of William Tell. This is Frank Goss, saying good night to you until next week at this same time, when you'll hear a true story from the life of Leif Erikson, the famous Viking. The following week, a true story from the life of President Andrew Johnson, starring Mr. Edward Arnold. On the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network.